Hello, welcome back to B5 Bible Study Network. This is Bernie Bishop. This is our Christmas service for 2020. I'm glad you can join us for the service today. We're going to be talking about uh, the, the promise child for us, Jesus Christ, and how God always keeps his promises. But before we do that, let's go ahead and uh, send a word of prayer. God, we thank you for your love, God. Thank you for your mercy, Lord, your, your word. Speak to us through your word tonight, God. It's about you know, how you always give your promises, God. Speak to us in a mighty way tonight. We know that uh, it's been a tough year. 2020 has been a tough year, but we know that you're in control, God. Everything's going to be okay. We look forward to the coming new year in 2021 pretty soon. Pray that we have a, have a better year. Take care of us, God. We pray in Jesus' name, Lord. Amen. So, so we're going to be talking about the uh, how God always keeps his promises. But as far as you, how do you do when it comes to making and keeping your promises? You know, do you always keep the promises that you make? You know, how, you know, but for, you know, God, but God always keeps His promises. That's the whole point of this message. God always keeps His promises. That's, that's such a key thing. So many instances in the Bible that God has made a promise, and He's shown Himself to be trustworthy. Right? God always keeps His promises. He has a perfect record when it comes to keeping His promises. I sure can't say that by myself, but I know God always keeps His promises. Okay. So case number one. God told us that His Son, Jesus Christ, would be born of a virgin. Told us that His Son, Jesus Christ, would be, would be born of a virgin, right? So where, where do we find this promise, you say? We find it in Isaiah 7, 14, which says, Therefore the Lord Himself will give you a sign, the virgin will be with child, and will give birth to a son, and will call him Emmanuel. Of course, that means God with us, right? Was this, was this promise fulfilled? You better believe this was fulfilled. And Jesus Christ came about... It says in Matthew 1.18, this is how the birth of Jesus Christ came about. His mother Mary was pledged to be married to Joseph, but before they came together, she was found to be a child through the Holy Spirit. So, of course, that was fulfilled through the birth of Jesus Christ. That is a virgin birth. That's very key. So then it says, uh, you know, you know, you know Magdalene, of course, means God is with us. And that's, that's very important. You know, God's with us. You know, He's not just somewhere out there, like the, like, like the deists think, but God is actually with us, right? You know, and then we had, uh, in Genesis 3.15, God tells us His redemptive plan. He says, I'll, I'll put enmity between your offspring and hers. He'll crush your head, and you'll strike his heel. So notice in Genesis here, that man isn't even mentioned, right? This is a foreshadowing of the virgin birth of Jesus Christ. So God carried out his redemptive plan through a woman, through a woman right? That's another promise there. So, Silent, Silent Night is a beloved Christmas song which talks about the virgin birth of the promised child, right? So, let me go ahead and sing this for you. Silent night, holy night, all is calm, all is bright, Silent night, holy night, shepherds quay at the sight, glorious chief from heaven above, heavenly host in hallelujah, Christ our Savior is born, Christ our Savior is born. Silent night, holy night, Son of God, love's pure light, Radiant beams from thy holy face, With the dawn of redeeming grace, Jesus, Lord, at thy birth, Jesus, Lord, at thy birth. Let's see, sometimes... God works in ways we just don't understand, right? But the bottom line is our God always, always, always keeps His promises. Amen? Case number two, God promised us that the promised child will be born in a particular place. God promised us that the promised child will be born in a particular place. So God told us in Micah 5.2, But you, Bethlehem, 
Epaphras, though you are small among the clans of Judah, out of you will come for me one who will be ruler over Israel, whose origins are born are from old. Right? So, you know, actually this is, you know, this was our Savior who was born in Bethlehem, right? You know, that's right there, that was a prophecy. So, of course, Jesus Christ was born in Bethlehem. So, you know, another, another, another promise was fulfilled, right? So, you know, in Matthew 22, 2, 2, 1, it says, After Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Judea, during the time of King Herod, Magi from the east came to Jerusalem. Why do you suppose Jesus was born in Bethlehem? Instead of some other place, like maybe Jerusalem? Let's see what God says about that in 1 Corinthians 1.27. 1 Corinthians 1.27 says, But God chose the foolish things of the world to shame the wise. God chose the weak things of this world to shame the strong. So why does God do this? In verse 20 of the same chapter, state, God says, He chose the lowly things of this world and the despised things and the things that are not to nullify the things that are, so that no one may boast before Him. So, you know, God, God you know, shames the wise and, and the things that are, that are smart and things that are, are, are strong in this world, God, put, God puts a shame, right? So we, 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 God doesn't want us to boast in our own power or in, in our own people, but God wants us to boast in Him, right? He's the one that's in control. You know, God, in Jesus Christ, he's, he's the one that's, that's royalty. He, but He chose a humble birth. Let alone, even though He's royalty, Jesus Christ chose a humble birth, right? In a humble place. Not, not, not like Jerusalem, but a humble place like Bethlehem, right? But, you know, when Jesus came to earth, not only to, to, to die for, for our sins, but to be able to, re to relate to the me all members of the human race, right? And if, if, he, if he died into, into Jerusalem in a palace, he wouldn't be able to relate to all members of the human race, because he basically is his royalty, he's a king and so on. But make sure he's, he's, he's died in a place that is humble, a humble birth, like, like Bethlehem. So it can relate to all human race. And that's, that's why the, the promise was fulfilled that says Jesus Christ was going to be born in Bethlehem, right? So the well-known song, uh, O Little Town of Bethlehem, talks about this, okay? O little town of Bethlehem, how still we see thee lie. Above thy deep and dreamless sleep, the silent stars go by. Yet in thy darkness shineth the everlasting light. The hopes and fears of all the years are met in thee tonight. For Christ is born of Mary and gathered above. While mortals sleep, the angels keep their watch of wandering love. O morning stars together proclaim the holy birth and praises sing to God the King and peace to men on earth. How silently, how silently the wondrous gift is given to God in past to human hearts the blessings of his heaven. No ear may hear his coming, but in this world of sin, where meek souls will receive him still, the dear Christ enters in. O holy child of Bethlehem, descend on us, we pray. Cast out our sin and enter in, be born in us today. We hear the Christmas angels, the great glad tidings tell. Um, come to us, abide with us, our Lord Emmanuel. Well, praise God! He was born in Bethlehem so many years ago. He went through the same things you and I go through, right? He can relate to his creation. He can relate, he can relate to you and I. You know, the writer of Hebrews encourages us with these words also. In Hebrews 4.15, teaches us, For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with us our weaknesses, but we have one who has been tempted in every way, just as we are, yet was without sin. So are you glad that we are, have a Redeemer? who can sympathize with our weaknesses? I know I am. 
I'm so glad that we have a, a, a God who keeps all of His promises. I sure know I, I'm very happy that we have a God who always keeps His promises, right? Case number three, God promised that His Son would be, would be a prophet. God promises us that His Son would be a prophet. So where in the Bible does it say that uh, God has promised that uh, you know, God, His Son would be a prophet? Take a look at me in Deuteronomy 18.15. It says, The Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from among your brothers. You must listen, you must listen to him. Right? That's way back in Deuteronomy 18.15. So how do we know this, was, this promise was fulfilled? Look with me in John 6.14. After the people saw the miraculous sign that Jesus did, they began to say, Surely this is the prophet who has come into the world. So what sign is this referring to? This was said right after Jesus fed the 5,000, right? He fed the 5,000 people, and right after this verse, it talks about how Jesus fled because the people were about to you know, forcefully make him king, right? But, you know, but God, you know, Jesus, he didn't come to be, uh, become a physical king in, 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 for Israel. Of course not. But they thought that he was going to come you know, overthrow the Roman government and make him a, uh, the king of, of, of Israel, right? But in reality, Jesus came to set up his heavenly kingdom, not an earthly one, right? That's, that's, that's the thing that some people were on earth, while well, Jesus was here on earth, they thought he was going to make a, a earthly kingdom, overthrow the Roman government. But no, Jesus Christ came to set up a heavenly kingdom, right? Not just an earthly one, not just you know things that, well, one that's temporary, but one that's an eternal instead, right? But Jesus was the greatest prophet this world has ever seen, right? Because he actually was God, and he still is God today and forevermore. A prophet's job is, is, is to proclaim the message of God to a person or to a group of people, right? So it's talk, taking a message from God and making it known to others, right? But Jesus is a prophet that this passage of Scripture is, is talking about here. Jesus, Jesus even, even prophesied his death and resurrection in Mark 9.31. The Son of Man will be betrayed into the hands of men, they will kill him, and after they three days, he will rise. There is no record of any Old Testament prophet predicting, first, his own death, and second, his own resurrection, right? For that matter, in all of, all of any religion, there's never been a prophet saying, okay, I'm going to die, it's how I'm going to die, and then after that, I'm going to be resurrected from the dead. That's never happened in, any, that never happened in, in Islam, or, you know, in, you know, or, or Buddhism, or any other ism. It's only through Jesus Christ that he actually prophesied his, his death and his resurrection, right? But, uh, you know, so it proves that, you know, now he is a prophet, that he himself is God, too, right? So no man can predict his death and resurrection and then accomplish it on his own power, but only God did through Jesus Christ. He prophesied his death and his resurrection on the power of God, not by man's power, right? Man does not have the ability to do, to, to, to do that, right? But God has the ability to predict his death and his resurrection and actually accomplish it by his own power. But once again, this is an example of our, our God fulfilling another promise. To his promised child, Jesus Christ, right? God always, always, always keeps his promises. Case number four, God promised that his son would be a priest. God promised that his son would be a priest. So where in the Bible does it talk about uh, that God's son would be a priest? God promises us in Psalm 110, verse 4, it says, The Lord has sworn and would not change his mind. You are a priest forever in the order of Melchizedek. So who is Melchizedek, you say? It talks about him in Genesis 14. He was a priest of the Most High, Yahweh. And he ended up uh, blessing Abraham after he had def just defeated his enemies in battle. But Abraham even gave, up, gave a tenth of everything he had to Melchizedek. Right? You know, you know, Melchizedek is only mentioned in the Bible three times. Once here in Genesis, once in Psalm 110, and of course in Hebrews. Melchizedek was a mystery man. Some people believe even that Melchizedek was a Christophany, which basically is a appearing of, of Jesus Christ in human flesh, you know, and as far as people can actually see them, right? Before, before Jesus Christ was actually born in the flesh here in, in, in Bethlehem, basically it might be a Christophany, that's what a lot of people think, right? But basically, uh, you know, even if, even if Melchizedek was not a Christophany, like some people th think he was, it is evident that he, was, he must have been a very important person, right? Because even Abraham 
get a tenth of everything he had to Mechazedek, right? Also, Mechazedek was a king. So he says, uh, of course, in Jesus, of course, he's, he's a, a high priest and he's the king of kings, right? And that, you know, we, you know obviously as, as a promised child. So, once again, this is fulfilled. We see in Hebrews in 620, 6.20 says, where Jesus who went... Excuse me a second. Okay, sorry about that. Welcome back. I thought I was talking about the interruption. Obviously, we have, we have three kids running around. We got, you know, babies crying, so on. So, you got to just kind of just take a breath there. But uh, anyways, we're talking about uh, Hebrews 6.20. It says, uh, where, where Jesus was born... What, what it says uh, in 6.20 of Hebrews, where Jesus, who went before us, has entered on our behalf. He has become a high priest forever in the order of Melchizedek. So, you know, that, that shows right there that uh, it, was, it was fulfilled. The writer of Hebrews, which a lot of times people think that's as Paul. It probably is, and we don't know for sure, but it probably is Paul. And uh, he basically said that, you know, in the order of Melchizedek, Jesus was, of course, he's a high priest and forever in the order of Melchizedek. Because now, not only is Jesus as, as a priest, but also as a king, too. He's the king of kings, right? So, what is the responsibility of a priest, you say? priest was responsible for speaking on behalf of another person, uh, on behalf of, to, to God, right? This must be the intercessor, intercessor between God and man. The go-between. Jesus Christ, is, of course, is our intercessor. He intercedes for us to God the Father on our behalf. He's our go-between. We don't have to rely on Mary or the saints or anybody else. All we need to do is rely upon Jesus Christ to intercede for us on our behalf. He's our go-between, right? So I'm so glad that Jesus Christ is our go-between. He's our mediator. He's our intercessor. Thank you, Lord Jesus. We love, we love you, Lord. But God fulfilled, of course, His promise once again, because God always, always, always keeps His promises. Amen. Case number five: God promised that Jesus would suffer for, for our sins. God promised that Jesus would suffer for our sins. Jesus was innocent, but He ended up suffering for our sins. So we're, we're in the Bible that talks about about this promise of God. Isaiah 53, verses 4 and 5, talks about this promise. Surely he took up our infirmities and carried our sorrows, yet we considered him stricken by God, smitten by him and afflicted, but he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was upon him, and by his wounds we are healed. Of course, during this Christmas season, we celebrate the birth of Jesus Christ, the incarnation of God, in the form of a man, right? But the truth of the matter is, Jesus was, Jesus was not born to live, he was born to die. To die for our sins. To die in our place. So we can, we can go to heaven with the, with the perfect, loving, heavenly Father. There had to be a sacrifice. And Jesus Christ was that perfect sacrifice. So he, he came to earth to die for our sins. To die in our, in our place. Thank you, Jesus. So this is the most precious Christmas present the world has ever seen, right? The last part of, of Isaiah verse, uh, I'm sorry, Isaiah 53 verse 5 says, By his wounds we are healed. So by the, his wounds, by Jesus Christ's wounds, we are healed. So we are healed, uh, obviously we're healed physically, but also we can be healed spiritually, mentally, emotionally. But Jesus Christ, uh, by his wounds we are healed, right? And also, you know, it talks about in uh, Matthew 8, 16 and 17, when evening came, many who were drawn, who were demon possessed, were brought to him, and drove out the spirits with a word and healed all the sick. This is supposed to fulfill what was spoken through the prophet Isaiah. He took up our infirmities and cured our diseases. He took care of those who had diseases back then, and he can also heal the sick today, right? During the time of the coronavirus, he can heal the people that are sick nowadays, right? So you know, he can take care of the people that are physically sick, take care of people that are mentally sick. Jesus Christ take care of people that are spiritually sick, right? He came to heal us from the disease called sin as well. As physical ailments, you know, so now not only did Jesus Christ come to you know to heal us from physical ailments, but he came to us to heal us from the disease of sin, right? So we can be with our perfect heavenly father in heaven forever. So he he, he dies so we can we can live, right? So this is of course another promise, you know, that the promised child you know fulfilled, right? You know, okay, there's a story about a, uh, an accounting department uh, where a large insurance company was working on a year-end report when the computers went down, right? So an emergency call went out, was put into the systems, the systems analyst. Of course, he was busy with other troubleshooting. The man didn't appear until maybe three hours later, somewhere around there. 
But yet, even when several clerks cheered, he's here, our Savior. So without a word, assistant analysts turned to leave. Panicked, the accounting manager cried in alarm, Where are you going? I'm leaving, the analyst said with a, with a smile. I remember what they did to the last Savior. Yeah, it's, a, it's a cute little story, a cute little joke, right? It's obviously not, not a true story. But uh, you know, the bottom line is Jesus Christ is our, our only Savior. He is the only one who suffered for our sins. That's, that's the key. He's the only one who suffered suffer in our place for our sins, right? But Jesus, Jesus suffered and died for our iniquities, for our sins. This is another tremendous example of how God always, always, always keeps His promises. Amen? Case number six, God promised His promised child would not stay in the grave. God promised that His, his promised child would not stay in the grave. God promises us this in 16, Psalm 16, verse 10. Because you will not abandon me to the grave, nor you will let your Holy One see decay. So the psalmist, David, was inspired to write this by God, of course. But this is talking about how Jesus was not going to be abandoned to the grave. That indeed, he would rise in the grave by the power of God, by the power of our Heavenly Father. He, he would not stay in the grave. He would be rising from the grave, right? But... You know, after this, it was Jesus in the grave for three days, he rose again. In Matthew 28, verse 9, it says, Considering the resurrection of the, of the promised child, suddenly Jesus met them. Greetings, he said. They came to him, clasped his feet, and worshipped him. The resurrection of Jesus Christ and the cornerstone of the Christian faith, right? Many people have tried their hardest to prove that this to be false. That it, ne that it never happened, right? In the, in the movie called uh, Risen, it was about that. It's a really interesting movie about it was it was it was had factual events and forth. But it was, it was basically they took uh, you know some creative creative liberties. But basically, the whole the whole premise of the movie is this, this guy was trying to, to prove that the resurrection of Jesus Christ did not occur. But the the, the man was trying, that was trying to do, do that, he actually found it for himself that of course indeed Jesus did rise in the grave. And at the very the very end of the movie, of course, in Risen. He, 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 even though God was trying to prove that Jesus Christ did not rise from the grave, he, he actually put his faith in Jesus Christ because actually he saw he actually was risen from the grave. But just, just another, another promise fulfilled, right? That you know Jesus Christ is, is going to be resurrected from the grave, and that you know over four, over five hundred people saw Jesus Christ on several occasions and stuff when uh, he, he rose from the grave. You know, and so many people you know were able to put their faith in Jesus Christ through that and spread the good word. Throughout the world, because they, they actually see Jesus with their eyes, that you know that they actually rose in the grave. You know, we, we give uh, Thomas. How many give Thomas a hard time? You know, we call him Down, Down and Thomas, right? But you know, like, what would happen if, if if we were not there when Jesus Christ appeared to the disciples, and he appeared to them and said, "Yeah, yeah, you know," but Jesus, he's alive, he's alive, right? But how would you fare? How would you fare if you actually were not in the room when that happened? You know, some of us might have said, well, I don't believe, you know, I would not believe until I see with my eyes that Jesus Christ rose from the grave. But when Thomas saw Jesus, he actually said, yeah, my Lord and my God. And you know, he actually got to the touch of scars where Jesus, you know, was, had the scars on his wrist and his feet one and his side. You know, that, that seed from himself, that actually Jesus did rise from the grave, right? I mean, this is, once again, this is a promise of God fulfilled. Because God always gives his promises, right? You know, the, the fire that lit the, the, the boiler of the New Testament to church is an inquenchable belief that if Jesus had been only a man, he would have stayed in the tomb, right? But they couldn't stay silent about the fact that the one they saw hung on a cross walked again on the earth and appeared to 500 people. I wonder if sometimes we stay silent because we've forgotten the one who was in the cross. Let us ask our Father humbly, yet confidently, in the name of Jesus, to remind us of the empty tomb, right? Let's see the victorious Jesus, the conqueror of the tomb, the one who defied death. And let us be remember, reminded that we too were granted the same victory, right? The same victory that rose, you know, the same power that rose Jesus from the, from the, from the dead will raise us up too. When we put our faith in Jesus Christ, he raised us up at the end of the day too, right? When we die, we'll be in heaven with him, with him forever too, right? God, God promised once again that Jesus Christ would not stay in the grave. Once again, he proved that he, he is always trustworthy. That he always keeps his promises. Because God always, always, always keeps his promises. Amen.
In the last one, case number seven, God promised that not only would his promised child be resurrected, but ascend into heaven as well. God promises that not only would his promised child be resurrected, but ascend into heaven as well. So where in the Bible does God talk about this promise? In Psalm 68, verse 18, it teaches us, When you ascend it on high, you let captives in your train, you receive gifts from men, even from the rebellious, that you, O Lord God, might dwell there. So how do we know this was fulfilled? Let us take a look at Luke 24, verses 50 and 51. When he led them out to the vicinity of Bethany, he lifted up his hands and blessed them. While he was blessing them, he left them and was taken up into heaven. So why is it so important that Jesus not only was resurrected from the grave, but also ascended to heaven? Well, look at me with me in John 20. Look at Mary Magdalene held on to the resurrected Jesus Christ. What did he tell her? In verse 17 of, of, of verse 20, uh, chapter 20 of John, Jesus tells Mary, Do not hold on to me, for I have not yet returned to the Father. So why did he tell her this? From the original Greek, we learned that Mary was holding on to Jesus tightly because she was afraid of losing him. But he reassured her that he, was, he would show himself to the other disciples and then, when he had to go where his father was, right? In order to finish the redemptive plan of God, Jesus had to ascend into heaven with his father, right? Also, if he didn't go to where his father was, he couldn't send the blessed Holy Spirit. He could not send the Comforter, the Holy Spirit, to us, right? So he had to go to the Father in heaven first to fulfill the redemptive plan. So it's very important that Jesus ascended into heaven. Is almost as important as his resurrection. So, you know, we got to make, make sure that this is a, you know, if you don't know about Jesus Christ, if you never, you don't, you know, never really heard the story about Jesus Christ and how he died for, you know, people's sins and that after that he resurrected from the grave and he ascended into heaven, this sounds uh, very far fetched. But, you know, but the bottom line is that it, it did happen. You got to receive it in faith that these actually did happen. They, they, God always keeps his promises, right? You know, our Heavenly Father didn't fail to live up to His promises because God always gives His promises. God, God is perfect. God is perfect. We are not perfect. But God always, always, always gives His promises, my friend. So put your faith in that, okay? We can, we can rest assured that we have a God that always gives His promises. He sent us a promised child, Jesus Christ, to reconcile us to Himself. We can depend on, on, on our, our Heavenly Father because He is the only one who is dependable. Our friends may fail us, our, our family, family may fail us, our, our, our spouse may fail us, but we have a, a God who will never fail us. We have a God who always, always, always keeps His promises, my friend. So be rest assured that you know, if you put your faith in Him, you will not be let down, you will not be disappointed. So I, I, I pray right now that if you do not know Jesus Christ right now as your personal Savior, I pray that you, time, now is the day of salvation, right? We celebrate Jesus Christ and Christmas, Christmas season for us, but if you don't put your faith in Jesus Christ, I encourage you to do that right now. It doesn't have to be a fancy prayer or anything like that. Just say, okay, God, I, I know I'm a sinner. I, I, I sin. I fall short of your, I'm your glory, God. I know that you're perfect, but I'm not, I'm, not, I'm not perfect. I need you to save me from my sins, God. I believe that Jesus Christ died on the cross for my sins, so I can go to heaven one day. I pray that you, know, you forgive me of my sins. Fill me up with the Holy Spirit, so that one day I'll be in, with you in heaven forever, God. We pray this for you now in Jesus' name. So if you really pray that, a prayer or something like that, that you acknowledge that you're a sinner, that you, you need Jesus Christ to die for your sins, to forgive you of your sins, to repent of your, of your sins, you got to turn from your sins, turn to God, that He'll forgive you of your sins, and you'll be a child of God, my friends. If you're a child of God, you're going to have one day. It's going to be awesome, guys. I'm, I'm, so, I'm so glad you've been able to join me with this, this Christmas sermon in 2020. God bless you guys. Uh, you know, Please subscribe and like. Uh, stay tuned for the next, next video. I make a video every Sunday. So God bless you guys. Have a great day. Merry Christmas, guys. I'm sorry. The most important thing about this, of course, Merry Christmas, right? So, uh, Merry Christmas. God bless you guys. Please subscribe and like. Have a great day. See you next time.